Today, volatility rules the property imperative weekly to the 7th December 2019. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to our latest post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. In this week's digest, we look at the latest economic news, which in the US took the markets higher, while locally the news continues to highlight pressures on our economy. And as normal, we'll start with international news, but if you want to jump directly to the Australian segment, the time is shown below. On Friday, US stocks closed solidly higher which helped to reverse the falls earlier in the week after President Donald Trump in London had implied that he would wait until 2020 to cement the Phase 1 trade agreement. Helping to lift stocks was news that China's State Council had begun the process on Friday of exempting some soybeans and pork imported from the US from tariffs, according to the state-run Shanghai News Agency, a move taken as a sign of progress on at least a partial trade pact. All the while, trade talk uncertainty over China's US-imposed obligation to import a staggering $40 billion worth of agricultural products remains a significant obstacle to tariff rollbacks. The action comes about nine days from a December the 15th deadline, at which time import duties on $156 billion worth of Chinese goods will be raised to 15%. And the US Labor Department said that the economy created 266,000 new jobs, and that's the biggest rise in 10 months. And the unemployment rate fell to 3.5%. That's a 50-year low, signalling that the jobs market remains robust in the US, even though economic growth has slowed. The government also revised the increase in new jobs in October to 156,000 from 128,000 and September's gain was raised to 193,000 from 180,000. The increase in new jobs easily topped the 180,000 market watch forecast and that was helped by the end of the General Motors auto worker strike which added roughly 50,000 jobs to the payroll number. The unemployment rate slipped to 3.5% from 3.6% and that matched a 50-year low. The average wage paid to American workers rose 7 cents or 0.2% to $28.29 an hour. And the 12-month rate of hourly wage gains slipped to 3.1% from 3.2% so wages growth is still slowing. The strong jobs report could reduce the urgency for a deal giving that escalating levies have failed to significantly dent growth. But it could also validate Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell's view that rates can stay on hold following three cuts. The headline data next week will significantly impact the tone of the Fed's meeting statement and Fed Chair Powell's press conference and could set Fed policy into 2020. As a result, investors pushed up the value of risk assets on the assumption that the American economy isn't close to signalling a recession, a fear that had confronted investors amid an ongoing trade war. And White House economic advisor Larry Kudlow said that the US and China are still, quote, close to reaching a phase one trade agreement. Though in more negative news, manufacturing activity contracted for the fourth straight month in November and the factory malaise has been blamed on the Trump administration's 17-month trade war with China, which has bruised business confidence and undercut capital expenditure. But in corporate news, shares of Apple surged above its record close to 270.71, up 1.93%. So the Dow Jones Industrial had 1.22% on Friday to 28.014, and its 337-point gain left the index finishing above 28,000 for the first time since November the 29th. The S&P 500 was up 0.91% on the day to 3,145, and the Nasdaq Composite was up 1% to 8,656. For the week, the Dow and the Nasdaq finished down 0.1%, while the S&P 500 notched a 0.2% gain for the five-day trading stretch. And for the year, the S&P 500 is up about 26%, the Dow has added 20%, and the Nasdaq has risen around 30%.
and there are just 17 trading days left in the year. Interest rates moved higher as Treasuries fell, with the 10-year yield rising to 1.843%, while the three-month fell to 1.523%. And this reaffirms the positive shape of the yield curve. Elsewhere, oil climbed after Saudi Arabia surprised the market by promising significant additional production cuts beyond that which was agreed with fellow OPEC members. There is nothing altruistic about Saudi Arabia's current stance on oil, though. It's about setting the oil price standard as high as possible into the Amroco IPO. Then all bets are off. West Texas Intermediate Crude settled up 1.2% to 59.13. And remember that multiple countries are cheating on quotas, so adherence to the cuts is unlikely. And even if states do comply, we need to consider whether this will just be a quick fix or whether it really is a longer term practical solution. We suspect the former. Gold fell in New York down 1.25% to 1,464 and that continues the downtrend as higher risk assets are more in demand. Gold will continue to get knocked around by the trade headlines if, and it's a big if, a comprehensive trade deal with a significant chunk of tariffs rolled back with China is agreed with the USA, then that would stimulate the trade flows and economic growth, cause the Fed to raise rates and strengthen the dollar. In that case, it wouldn't make much sense to own gold as the economic outlook would be much brighter and the costs of owning haven assets like gold become much higher, but it remains uncertain. The euro fell after Germany's industrial slump unexpectedly deepened in October amid a steep fall in manufacturing. And the euro-US dollar rate fell 0.39% to 1.1059. The German 10-year bond was up 0.86% to minus 0.289%, while the German 30-year bond was up 1.97% to 0.233% and is in positive territory. The People's Bank of China has so far been reluctant to open the monetary taps to a large-scale easing program, as concerns over the soaring CPI and a rising macro leverage ratio remain significant issues. The Shanghai Composite was up 0.43% to 2,912, and the US dollar yuan was down 0.14% to 7.0488. The pound has held on to recent gains well, with marginal pullbacks so far. The markets still think a Tory win is likely, and thus Brexit will result from next week's poll. But any misstep by PM Johnson could trigger some position adjustments ahead. The FTSE was up 1.43% to 7,329, and the pound US dollar was slightly lower to 1.3139, but is still higher than the late. The Reserve Bank of New Zealand this week announced the new bank capital buffers. With a phase in period over seven years, the longer duration than expected previously five years was taken positively by the market, which had feared that a shorter implementation period would force the Reserve Bank to remain in an eternal dovish stance. And Bitcoin was up 1.6% to 7,524, with a new record having been set by the Bitcoin network for the largest transaction volume to ever be recorded within one hour in all of the network's history. On Thursday the 5th of December, approximately $9 billion was moved in a series of transactions in less than an hour. The funds belong to the Bittrex crypto exchange and the transfer was completed in about 21 transactions, each worth around 56,000 bitcoins. Perhaps the fund transfers were done as part of maintenance activity being carried out by the crypto exchange. The exchange had previously announced in a blog post that it would be undergoing scheduled maintenance. Bittrex so far has not announced anything about the transfer. The movement is however not strange as crypto exchanges are known to move funds from one place to another whenever they're running upgrades and doing routine maintenance. And it's also come to light that Bittrex spent less than $19 in transfer fees to move all of the money. While large transfers like this usually tell in market prices, the price of Bitcoin has not changed much in response to the movement. And a report from Deutsche Bank forecasts that by 2030, crypto will have replaced fiat. 
saying there's a good chance cryptocurrencies will replace fiat currencies in the next 10 years. The report claims that this will happen because of all the problems currently being faced by the fiat system available today. According to the Imagine 2030 report, in a section called The End of Fiat Money by strategist Jim Reed, fiat money has been kept alive for so long with activity that has now had a detrimental effect on it. Reed writes that this current fiat system has survived so long, has required a fortuitous set of global forces across multiple decades that has created sizable natural offsetting disinflationary forces. Reed then says, even though there could be problems with strong enough adoption of crypto in the near future, the factors that have been responsible for holding the system in place are slowly getting weak and could very easily give way over the next 10 years. The forces that have held the current fiat system together now look fragile, and they could unravel in the 2020s. If so, that would start to lead to a backlash against fiat money and demand for alternative currencies such as gold or crypto could soar. But of course, there are many countries now interested in digital currencies, including France and India, and many are opposed to private cryptos, preferring a central bank-backed alternative. So the future may be crypto, but not necessarily Bitcoin. Hi, it's Liz Interruption. But if you're getting value from this post and have not done so, please consider subscribing to this channel or ring the bell for custom alerts. Plus, please consider supporting our efforts. You can make a one-off donation via PayPal, here's the link, or subscribe via Patreon for as little as $3 US a month or more to get access to exclusive additional content. Alternatively, you can also donate using Bitcoin. Here is the QR code. The links are in the comments below. I really appreciate your support, which enables us to continue to make more great content. Thanks very much. Now, back to the current show. And so to the local market. We've already covered the economic readouts in our post Data, Data Everywhere, Not Only a Drop to Drink, where we took apart the latest GDP retail and trade figures. In essence, the economy continues to slow and households are in particular under pressure. This chimes with our latest household surveys, as reported in both our Mortgage Stress Report and Household Financial Confidence Index, again this week. Both already have been covered well on the DFA channel. Real average compensation per employee has collapsed down 2.2% since March 2012, although it has reposted as very small rebound over recent quarters. And more analysts are confirming that the RBA is hopelessly out of alignment with the reality of what is occurring. At the moment, the government continues to support the economy with ever greater infrastructure investment, but are resisting more direct support. So it'll be interesting to see what the mid-year forecast, which is out soon, says. And so to the property market. The Opal Tower grief continues, as reported by the New Daily, saying that the builder behind Sydney's Opal Tower had lodged a counterclaim in the New South Wales court, blaming the engineer for the cracking that caused the tower's evacuation and repair bill of more than $30 million. In the latest developments in the continuing saga, Icon, the builder of the tower, has lodged documents in the New South Wales Supreme Court alleging the cracking and damage was caused by, quote, shortcomings in its design. It alleges WSP Structures, the global engineering firm behind the $170 million complex, prepared and approved all relevant structural designs. And as the builder, Icon, alleges it undertook construction based on WSP's designs, which it says were faulty. The allegations are part of a counterclaim in response to the class action suit lodged in the New South Wales Supreme Court by Opal Tower residents in July. And we also heard this week that more faulty buildings are emerging thanks to the use of particular types of engineered wood. Thousands of apartment owners across Australia who thought they were safe from potentially deadly cladding fires now face millions of dollars in bills to remove and replace timber-based panels. In the landmark legal ruling, timber PVC cladding that was believed to be a reliable alternative to dangerous aluminium composite has now also been declared unsafe. This puts the widely used biowood panelling into the same category of major defects of the kind that caused the catastrophic 2017 blaze at London's Grenfell Tower, in which 72 people died, and the La Crosse building in Melbourne, 
where this year owners won $5.7 million in damages after a cladding fire in 2014. This will affect thousands and thousands more buildings across Australia, said the lawyer who conducted the case at the New South Wales Civil and Administrative Tribunal. We think this is the first ruling in Australia and possibly in the world against biowood and it will have consequences for so many buildings that use it. Thinking of it as a safe and aesthetically pleasing cladding. Owners of apartments in buildings out of the six-year claims period, however, won't be able to sue developers and builders for defects. They will be compelled to undertake the replacement at their own cost. And we think there is still much more to come in the construction saga, one reason why punters are avoiding high-rise like the plague. And to underscore that, the Australian Industry Group Housing Industry Association Performance of Construction Index, the Australian PCI, registered 40.0 points seasonally adjusted in November, and that was down by 3.9 points from the previous month, indicating that the construction industry on aggregate declined more sharply in November. November was the 15th consecutive month of contraction in the Australian PCI, with aggregate industry activity remaining firmly entrenched in negative territory and overall new orders falling more sharply. This ongoing weakness in building conditions was associated with a steeper fall in employment and a continued reduction in deliveries from suppliers. And CoreLogic's auction clearance data showed 3,206 total auctions last week with a clearance of 73.6% and 1,966 were cleared auctions compared with total auctions of 2,749 a year ago with a clearance of 41.3%. Now, I want to highlight that the comparison between the listed auctions and cleared auctions consistently comes out lower than the core logic method. For example, in Sydney, there were 794 successful auctions from the 1,221 listed for auction, so the clearance rate is 65%, not 78.1%, as core logic reported. Using our basis of assessment, clearance rates are being overstated. Their index also continues to report high results across the board, with quarterly rises in Sydney of 6.3%, Melbourne of 6.56%, and Brisbane of 2.01%. The price index, however, fell 0.81% in Perth over the same period. And the annual chart also shows rises. Now, of course, the continuing question is how this index tracks to real prices. And the continuing story is one of some rises and some falls, so in a way, the overall index is of little help in interpreting the current state of play. And the Council of Financial Regulators, which brings together APRA, ASIC, the Federal Treasury and the RBA, plus the ACCC and Austrac, met on November the 29th. The group said that while growth in housing credit was subdued, particularly among investors, lending to owner occupiers has picked up in the two biggest cities, Sydney and Melbourne. This suggests they say credit growth is likely to strengthen. Now, I would make the point that there is little evidence of that yet, but let's see what the loan flow data from the ABS says next week. The council said in its December quarterly statement, overall near-term risks related to the housing market have lessened as housing market conditions nationally have improved. Financial risks have grown in the past year as Australia's economic growth has slowed and unemployment has ticked higher putting pressure on households with large mortgages. The housing sector accounts for between 40 and 50% of household and bank assets. Record low interest rates have worked to reignite home prices, which posted their strongest month in 16 years in November, again according to CoreLogic. However, data on Wednesday showed that the economy struggled in the September quarter due to weak consumer spending. Worries about tighter lending standards hurting small businesses were discussed by the council, an issue which Josh Frydenberg have raised with the country's big four banks in an effort to boost a sluggish economy. Banks have reigned in lending following the public inquiry last year, which found widespread misconduct and irresponsible lending tactics in the sector. And the Australian Securities Investing with Commission is working on responsible lending guidance due for release in the next few weeks, in which it will confirm that responsible lending requirements do not apply to loans made mainly for business purposes, the council said. And council members stress that the flow of credit is fundamentally important to the functioning of the Australian economy and discuss the concerns that lenders' risk appetite for some types of lending may have swung too far towards caution 
their statement said. So, in essence, they are still peddling the line that more credit is needed despite our astronomical high debt levels and flat incomes. This seems pretty crazy to me. And finally, to the markets, the SX100 was up 0.38% to 5,563, below recent highs. The ASX Financials Index was up 0.28% to 5,961, but well off its highs. The Aussie US dollar was up to 68.39, slightly above recent lows, despite the poor GDP results. And the gold Aussie cross was down 1.2% to 2,134, and the Aussie Bitcoin cross was up 0.85% to 10,947. But before I go, a quick reminder that our next live stream event is scheduled for Tuesday the 17th of December at 8pm Sydney time, where you can hear about our updated scenarios and ask questions live. And you can ask a question either via the chat or send a question in beforehand via the DFA blog. The links are in the comments below. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.